very much for the invitation. It's a great honor for me to be here. Joran van Klaver was born on January 23 in 1979 in Amsterdam in a pretty regular family, father, mother, a brother, not a brother, younger, a sister, a cat in Amsterdam. I was born and raised there uh, in a, a we're practicing Protestant family. After I finished high school, I studied comparative religion. I, I was a teacher for a few years. There happened a lot of things in the Netherlands, especially in my life. Also, when I look at the bigger picture when it came to Islam, I became politically active for the Freedom Party. I became a member of parliament. And in the end, I decided to write an anti-Islam book, which started as an anti-Islam book, changed into this search for God, and it ended up me becoming a Muslim. <laughs> How was your life in regards to faith? What did you believe in? Before I was a Muslim, I was a Protestant Christian from the Reformed Church. We read from the Bible, we all got biblical names, we were all baptized, uh, we went to church, etc., etc. So we're pretty yeah. Christian in that way, in that sense. Of course, I believe that there is a creator. I believed in heaven, hell. I believed in angels, revelations. And of course, what separates the Christians from the Muslims is that I believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Yeah, in, in a more uh, philosophical way, I believed he was God himself, of course. I believed in the resurrection and crucifixion of Christ, of course. And I believed in the atonement. So, But because the Trinity is a very complex concept, whether you believe it or not, it's still very complex because if there is a God in the Bible, it says God is eternal. But if you are eternal and at the same, in the same, you die, you cannot be eternal and mortal at the same time. So that was something when I was a little older, 16, 17, I started questioning things like that. It's not very logical. And I talked to many, many priests, preachers, even rabbis, and the answers I got weren't very satisfying. That made it for me kind of complex. And, and in the end, I had some doubts about this, stuff like this. But I said, well, I set it aside and I thought, okay, I just, I just believe it and perhaps I'm not smart enough to get the whole picture. And I still believed in uh, God. I still believe that Jesus was a very important person. I believed he was the son of God, but how it exactly was, I, I left it for what it was. How and why did you decide to write an anti-Islamic book? After high school, I went to a university and I did comparative religion. And a remarkable thing, I think, was that the first day of me going to college was uh, September 11, 2001. Already thought, okay, these Muslim guys are kind of crazy and this religion isn't the truth. Then a few years later was this guy in the Netherlands called Theo van Gogh, Theo van Gogh. He was a famous filmmaker and he was killed in the street. He was shot and they tried to slit his throat and they put a knife in his stomach with a letter on it for another girl, Aya and Hirshi Ali. And it was, it said, you are next. So it strengthened my anti-Islam feelings in such a way that I thought, well, I have to become politically active to do something and stop this evil of harming our country. You started politics because of Islam. Yeah, and that had really had to do with Islam. That was the reason that I wanted to write a book to explain to people why Islam was a danger for the world. When I was writing my book, like I said earlier, the questions, the doubts I had about Christianity popped up again. And that was about truth, of course, because I was a believing Christian guy. And yeah, the Christian questions I had in the end were answered in an Islamic way. Because of course, when I started writing the book, a lot of people think that it was an, a political book, but it wasn't so much a political book, it was a religious book because I wanted to show people why Islam was a danger as a religion and I wrote it from a Christian perspective. So in the beginning I made a comparison between the Christian concept of God and the Islamic concept. So I start comparing it. But because I had these doubts about the Trinity and I saw Tawhid, yeah, the oneness of God in Islam, I thought, yeah, it sounds a little bit more logical. And then I thought to myself, well, I reread the Bible to see, to refresh myself, to see, okay, why isn't the concept of Islam, the Tawhid concept, isn't the Christian concept. But when I was reading the Old Testament and I saw what the Old Testament prophets said, it was one God, one God, one God. And then I thought, okay, I'll look only at the words of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And then there's this story in the New Testament that where a guy comes to Jesus and he asks him, what is the most important thing? in life. How can I gain paradise? And he says there are two things. He says, here, O Israel, here your God is one. Treat your neighbor as you want to be treated yourself. So I thought, well, even Jesus Christ says, here, O Israel, your God is one. So I thought, well, this whole Muslim concept of God sounds more logical. And it's the same concept that I find in the Old and the New Testament. And I know Christianity as a religion teaches something else, but it isn't the concept of God that I find in the Bible. So after weeks and weeks of study, reading, 
reading, rereading uh, kinds of books, I thought to myself, okay, perhaps this oneness of God is something that is true. So that's how it started. What resources did you use while doing your research? Because I was kind of shocked, I started writing to several authorities on these religious matters. And one of the guys that I wrote to was Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, and he's a professor from Cambridge University. But in a way, it was kind of strange, of course, because I was a politician back then still. I was writing an anti-Islam book with an anti-Islam purpose. And I'm asking this Muslim professor from another country, can you help me? <laughs> So I told him, I'm writing a book. I have a lot of questions. So I, I was very plain why I thought, why is Islam promoting terrorism? Why is anti-woman? Why is anti-Christian, anti-whatever? After, I think, six weeks, he, he sent me a, a very extensive email and he started explaining, directly answered a lot of my questions. But he also told me, you have to read this article, read this book, read that book, ask this person. And so he was very extensive in his way of explaining. But in the end, after I read all these books and articles and made com a comparison between prophets from the Old Testament with Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. I had no arguments anymore to say they are prophets and he is not. And I thought to myself, well, if I accept Moses on these grounds and I cannot accept the prophet, then there is something else. So I thought, why don't I think he is a prophet? And I thought, oh, perhaps because he had many wives. But then again, when you look at Solomon or you look at King David, Abraham, there are a lot of people in the Old Testament that had more wives. And when you look at even outside of the religious books, culturally in Europe, in, in Africa, Asia, everywhere, there were men with several wives uh, for several reasons. So I thought to myself, well, that cannot be a reason either. So one by one, all these reasons fell. And in the end, I thought, well, I have to say all of them are not prophets. But I, I didn't believe that because I thought, well, the things they did, they said, the miracles that happened, etc., they were confirmed in what they said and what they did. So they are. And then I said, well, then I have to accept that Prophet Muhammad perhaps is is a prophet too. So I was doubting it. So first I thought, well, it's the most evil person I know because of the history. Then I said, well, perhaps it's not that evil, but he's not a prophet. And in the end, I start doubting, perhaps he is a prophet. Yeah, that took, of course, me reading a lot of books again. And the one thing that I think was very wise of Abdul Hakim Murad to say was, he said, well, the books you read about with the anti-Islam arguments are written by non-Muslims. He said, if you want to know more about Christianity, you don't read books from atheists. You start reading the books from the Christians. Why do they believe this? What are the arguments? So that you have to do the same with Islam. So start reading Islamic books from Islamic teachers, from Islamic scholars, etc. And then you can see if you compare the books on the same topic of people who are Muslim and wrote those books and non-Muslim, you can see where they took the wrong turn, where they translated words in the wrong way, sometimes perhaps even not on purpose, but just because they didn't know where things are added, where things left out of it. So, and in the end, you see there's this other religion almost created because of all these things. And that's what I did. And that's what I also did with the life of the prophet, because I read a book from Martin Lynx, the life of the prophet based on the earliest source of Muhammad. And it was written, of course, by a convert. And his way of reasoning, his way of telling, his way of writing appealed to me because it's culturally the same thing. How do I approach a certain topic, etc.? And it was the first time that I saw him not so much as a warlord, because that's the picture I had in my mind, but I saw him as a father and I saw him as a friend and a teacher and so much more and so yeah I saw the person and his character and I said well I can say a lot but I cannot say that this is not a good man so his character persuaded me to read more and to want to know more what surprised you the most while doing your research? The story about Hint, there was something that, like a switch, like I had to change. And it was because I thought Hint was the wife of one of the enemies, Abu Sufyan. And in a way, they gave money to kill Hamza, the favorite uncle of the prophet. And that was what happened on the battlefield. He got killed. They even paraded with his ears and cut off his nose and horrible stuff. So the prophet was deeply sad, of course, of what happened. And years and years later, he became powerful. He came in power in Mecca. And then there was Hint. And I was reading this book and I thought, okay, now she gets crucified or her head gets cut off or something like that. But he said, well, I cannot look at her right now, but everybody is forgiven. And if you want to stay here and live among the Muslims, it's possible. If you don't want that, you can go. But bloodshedding is over now. And I thought to myself that she was forgiven. If you can forgive someone who kills a relative, especially a favorite uncle of you, even starts parading with parts of his body to show other people that she humiliates you 
and whatever you stand for. That means you have such a great character. It's very special. It's, it's, it's something you don't see. And that's what he did. So I thought to myself, well, it was a really special guy. And when I thought that, I thought, yeah, well, I have these arguments for him being a prophet. I see his character. I see the way he treated other people. I see how he treated his enemies. I think he is a prophet. But then I thought to myself, whoa, that's horrible. Because I already accepted this oneness of God. And now I say he is a prophet. If I say there is only one God and Muhammad is his prophet, that's almost shahada. <laughs> so I thought to myself, okay, let's close the books. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> this is going in the wrong direction. And of course, I wasn't that anti-Islam anymore because of what I read and what I saw and what I experienced. What I tell you now, it sounds a little like a fairy tale, but it really happened. In the end, there were all these books at the table. And when I had this feeling of, yeah, okay, this is shahada in a way, I said, well, I put all the books away and I put uh, the books on the highest shelf. But there were so many books that a lot of books fell off the shelf. And one of the books that fell off the shelf was the Quran. And when I picked it up, my hand was on a page with Surah 22, Ayat 46. And it says, it's not the eyes that are blind, but the hearts. And I thought to myself, that really is my problem because it wasn't the eyes. I, I really could see what I written down myself. Nobody forced me to write this book. Nobody said you have to write this or that. I started writing myself and I could see it with my own eyes, but I still couldn't accept the fact that I said he is a prophet. There is this one God. I just couldn't. So it wasn't my eyes that were blind, but it was really my heart. I couldn't accept it. I think my nafs or my nafs or whatever, my ego, I, I couldn't accept it. And I said, well, God, I don't care if it's the God from the Bible or the Quran, give me a sign or something so that I 100% sure know this is the way. And I went to bed, but when I woke up, I felt very secure in myself. I really felt very secure. I, I've never been more secure about anything else. The whole anxiety or the whole doubting issue it disappeared like, like snow for the sun. And I thought to myself, well, I think I'm a Muslim. Well, and then of course I had to tell other people. What was the reaction of the people around you when you became Muslim? Most of them were very negative, yeah, of course. For a lot of people, especially some uncles and aunts, it was kind of a shock. They heard it when it was on the news. I told my mother and my mother started crying. And my wife was pretty open. Yeah, she was very cool about it. She said, well, if Islam is what you really believe and that's in your heart, who am I? And yeah, some people from my old work were really aggressive. I got uh, over uh, 2,000 death threats from people who used to support me, of course. People who voted for me. People said the most horrible things. So we were rape your wife, shoot you, you know where your children go to school, stuff like that. And most of them, of course, are is nonsense because they're crazy people writing things on their computer. So it was a kind of a hectic time. Uh, and I had to tell my work, of course, and it was this Christian organization, so to say, that the leader of the pack, he said, I can't believe it. And he said, well, I, I noticed this change when you talked about certain topics on radio. You were kind of a little more mild, not so harsh anymore, but you becoming a Muslim. And after I said, yeah, I became Muslim. He said, I couldn't sleep for it for two days. I couldn't accept it. It was so, so strange. But the, the hardest part for me was telling my grandfather because my grandfather was dying and he was 93, 94 years old and he was on his deathbed at home. I had to tell him and my mother told me, yeah, you have to tell your grandfather. It was his, her father. So I said, well, then you have to come with me. He's got like a shield. And then I just said, well, grandfather, I, uh, I became Muslim. And then he closed his eyes. And I thought he stopped breathing because yeah, he was so old and he really stopped breathing for a while. And then he started breathing again and he looked at me and he said, well, at least you didn't become a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> so it was very funny. The last thing, and my old boss from the radio, he said, well, how do we know that you're not becoming Hindu one day or something else? Or And I told him, well, I never chose a religion one time. And it was when I became a Muslim. Before that, I didn't choose my religion. I was born in a Christian family. I was raised in a Christian way. And I'm very grateful for all the good things that it brought me. But it was not my decision. And the only time I made a decision was me becoming a Muslim. And it was the most, like I said, I think the most important decision I made. And it was the most rational decision I made. I never took years and years to decide one thing, only becoming a Muslim. How did you feel when you made your first Salah? It's, of course, a beautiful moment, but very strange as well. Because as a Christian, you're not used to pray like that. You pray with your hands together and perhaps on your knees in front of your bed or something. But I think it's very beautiful that you really prostrate. So you really bow down in the deepest way for your Lord. So that's a very humbling, beautiful thing, I think. And that, yeah, it made me feel very happy. 
What were the three biggest challenges you faced when you converted to Islam? Well, becoming a Muslim, of course, was a big challenge because I had to tell the world and family, and that was a big challenge. The part of thinking that it would be very hard to become a Muslim, because especially as a Protestant Christian, there aren't so many things you have to do in a religious sense. As a Muslim, in terms of practice, it is required to pray five times a day. It's required to eat in a certain way. It is required to think in a certain way. You have to be the best in a way every moment because of your relation with your creator and because of the fact that you have to pray five times a day it's a constant reminder in a way of the creator so I experienced and I thought to myself whoa five times a day praying I cannot do this I cannot do that I have to do <laughs> so that made it hard in the head but after I became Muslim it wasn't hard at all are you raising your kids as Muslims well you try of course I don't know when when you're really raised as a Muslim it's I think it's a very difficult job especially in the these times. Of course, when I married, I wasn't a Muslim. You promised in a way that you raise your children as Christians. So after I became Muslim, I'm not raising my children as Christians, of course. If the kids have questions about Christianity, they ask my wife, they get Christian answers. And if they come to me, they get Islamic answers. But most of the time, she says, ask your father. And my wife cooks halal for everybody. So that's very sweet. She says, well, I'm not going to cook five meals. So everybody eats the same. You want halal, everybody eats halal. So <laughs> in a way, it's, it's like like an organic process. What was your heaviest and most regretful expression that you used for Islam? I think Islam is a lie because that's something I used to say. Islam is a lie, the Quran is poison. But uh, when I said Islam is a lie, that's the whole religion and everything that comes with it. So that's like the highest level of jahiliya in a way. <laughs> yeah, that's something I regret because it was like an umbrella and everything else was under this concept of Islam is a lie because that was the core thought. And in a way, I understand it because in a political sense and in a social cultural sense, everything I said and done is still there. I sometimes even hear arguments from people in my old party that I invented in a way. Yeah, that's something that bothers me. And that's one of the reasons that we founded an organization. It's called the IXC, Islam Experience Center. And we go to schools, primary school, high school, college, universities, but also to departments of the government, other social organizations, churches, to take away misconceptions about Islam, to share the message, to show Islam in its true colors. And we do it by a virtual reality with the glasses. So it's a very fun experience as well. And we try to erase in a way the things I said and done in the past. How should people research about Islam? Do you advise just searching at Google? No, I would certainly not advise Google. It's the last thing I would advise. I said shut down the computer. No, I think it's very important that people read books, real books with pages and stuff. I would recommend uh, Muhammad is life based on the earliest sources of Martin Links, the book I talked about earlier. It's a green book. And I think it's very important for people not just dive in the Quran because it's a very complex book. And if you don't have anybody who can teach you what you read, especially Especially most of the people who don't know anything about Islam are not fluent Arabic, classic Arabic speaking people. Uh, so you will read an interpretation of the Quran or a translation and most of the time that's not the real deal of course. So I would advise people just to study the Sirat, study the character and the life of the Prophet because that's what the tradition teaches us as well. His life was the Quran, he was the living Quran in a way. Just study his Sunnah and I think that is the best way of discovering Islam. What would you like to say as your final comments? I became much more happy after I became Muslim. So I would like to invite everybody to become Muslim just because it brings peace to your soul and peace to your heart. It is the truth. It resonates with heart and soul. At least look at it from an Islamic perspective. Try to read and study the life of the Prophet. Try to understand what the Muslims believe. Not so much the behavior of Muslims because there are a lot of Muslims that don't live like Muslims, including myself. I don't always live like a Muslim and shoot, like we all do, but you should look at the example of all examples, and it was the Prophet. And if you study his life, perhaps you find uh, guidance that leads you to, uh, to the truth.